Hello, morning. all you romantics out there. Happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Mm. Yes, happy Valentine's How Day. How will you be celebrating? <laughs> oh, well, we won't be going anywhere and we won't be doing anything. No. 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 Valentine's Day is a fascinating concept. Is it? it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Steeped in history and tradition. Okay. And it's really very much about Christian faith. Now, one legend, I'm reading this from my History Channel uh, entry. One legend contends that Valentine was a priest who served during the 3rd century in Rome. Okay. Oh, yes. When Emperor Claudius II decided that single men made better soldiers than those with wives and families, <laughs> quite understandable, he outlawed marriage for young men. Valentine realising the injustice of the decree, defied Claudius and continued to perform marriages for young lovers in secret. When Valentine's actions were discovered, Claudius ordered that he be put to death. <laughs> Still others insist that it was St. Valentine... Oh, blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, anyway, the Bible says that in 1 John 4, 7 to 12, it says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. And yes. everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So whilst we might have Valentines and we might narrow it down to couples and everything else, the bottom line is, is that love is, don't do that, you put me off. <laughs> love is from God and God requires that we love one another. That is how people will know that we're his disciples, yes, how exactly. we love one another. So whilst our theme is not all about love this morning, there's a bit of a love undertone. Love undertone? Love undertone. Love. We're actually, no, not a lug undertone, oh. a love undertone. And um, and so to get us started, we're going to hand over to the worship team who are going to lead us as we worship the King whom we love. Lovely. Steadfast in your love Yesterday, today, forever the same And at your name, my knee will bow My tongue confess that you are Lord And my heart fills with praise By the King of kings, Lord of lords Prince of peace, morning star God, great I am, O oh Lord. You are first and last, risen one, son of man, yet son of God, and I worship you alone. For you alone are gone. afraid I put my hope in you I know I can depend on your unfailing love forgiven now I stand amazed before your throne I wear instead of shame a mantle of grace so I raise my hands I lift my voice Shout for joy, for I am saved, and my heart fills with praise. You are the King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince of peace, morning star, mighty God, great I am, O oh Lord. You are first and last, risen one, son of man, yet son of When I 
Thank you for that, guys. Always great. Now I've got I've got a special treat for you. For so me, got, yeah, a little song. Mm. Okay, so it goes like this: When I get older, losing my hair, many years from now, not that many actually. I'm fifty this year. Will you sell, still be sending me a Valentine birthday greeting bottle of wine? I would have to say wine as Christians. If I be out till quarter to three. Not a chance on lockdown. Would you lock the door? We afternoon. 
Would you still need me? Would you still feed me when I'm 64? I could be handy mending a fuse when your lights are gone. You can knit a sweater by the fireside. Sunday morning, go for a ride. Or we'll be at church. Oh, yeah. Do in the garden, dig in the weeds. Who could ask for more? Yeah. Let's sway together. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? <laughs> I haven't finished yet, so I don't know. Oh, I'm not, I'm not worried if you're going. bored. You'll be 64 by the time you finish. It's not that far away. Send me a postcard. Drop me a line. Stating point of view. Indicate precisely what you mean to say. You're sincerely <laughs> wasting your <laughs> I, I, Give me your answer. Fill in a form. Mine forevermore. Oh, will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64, ba ba -na -na. When I'm 64, ba ba -na -na. When I'm 64, boom, 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 boom. Doubt it. I'm sure you were thrilled with that. Anyway, we're going to hand it over to... No, we're not going to hand over anywhere. We've created this this morning. God's idea is love, and this is what he means. If I had the gift to speak in other languages without learning them, and if I could speak in every language that there is, in all of heaven and earth, but do not have love, and didn't love others, I would only be making a noise. If I had the gift of prophecy, I knew all about what is going to happen in the future knew everything about everything, but did not love others. What good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith, so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. If I gave everything I had to poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't have love, it would be of no value whatever. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way, it is not irritable or touchy, it does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices when truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him, no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end, but love goes on forever. Someday, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, this gift will disappear. Now we know so little, even with our special gifts, and the preaching of those most gifted is still so poor. But when we have been made perfect and complete, then the need for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end, and they will disappear. When I was a child, I spoke, thought, 
and reason as a child does. But now I've become a man. My thoughts have grew far beyond those of my childhood. Now I have put away childhood things. In the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we were peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, we are going to see him in his completeness, face to face. Now, all that I know is hazy and blurred, but then I will see everything clearly, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. There are three things that remain, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. I thought I'd just share with you something that um, we were told when we were on our school pastors training. We had a lecture or a talk from a guy called Timmy Anson who was um, is a mental health um, nurse and um, he talks about our mental health and what can help and one of the things that he talked about was imagining that your mental health or your mental well-being is, is like on a scale that goes up and down and and we have to expect it to go up and down and you know you wake up in the morning and it's a bright sunny day and you feel a little bit better or you're in November and you wake up and it's that grey foggy misty day and you just yeah your mood just lowers a bit and we know that we 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 say it I feel brighter I feel low it's going up and down on the scale and what he encouraged us to do as school pastors was to to think about that for other people and to make it our aim that from an interaction that somebody had had with us whether it's a conversation or playing the game or whatever that the person would go away feeling a little bit brighter than when they'd come into it that they would just have lifted their mood a little bit we're not going to sort everything for them we're not going to be able to sort all their problems but if an interaction with us could just make them feel a little bit better, then the next time something happens, they're starting from a higher place. And that put me in mind of um, somebody in the Bible, somebody in the New Testament, and um, he was called Joseph. Uh, and I think there must have been lots of Josephs around at that time. Um, and I could imagine two people in the early church saying, oh yeah, I was just with Joseph. And they said, Joseph, Joseph who? He goes, you know Joseph. The guy that's really encouraging. Oh, I know who you mean. Oh, yeah, being with Joseph is just great. He's such an encouragement. I know. And if encouragement had a son, it would be him, wouldn't it? It would. He's a real Barnabas, he is. And so his nickname, which means encourager, soon became, oh, Joseph Barnabas. And in the end, they just called him Barnabas. He was known as the encourager, the one who encourages. That made me think, two things actually the first thing it made me think was if somebody was to to give me a nickname linked to what I'm like or who I am I wonder what that would be and I did come up with one and it is I would say it is the challenging one or the one who challenges and um, I know that can go two ways and you can decide which one you think suits me best what nickname could people come up with for you have a think about that. But what if we became known as the Barnabases? If people enjoyed being with us because they went away feeling a little bit brighter than they came in. If to be with the people of God meant that life felt a little bit better for them. And so I just throw that one at you. Can you be a Barnabas? Can you lift somebody's mood just a little bit? Can you give them a little bit of encouragement? Because you might actually find that doing that for somebody else lifts your mood as well. Hi, Jaji. Thank you so much. I've been sick and now I'm feeling better. Thank you for praying for me. And thank you for everyone, especially for
for, for Rose and Stephen and Pastor Jonathan and everyone who has prayed for Chris Ben. Now he's feeling better. He's better. He's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, he's, okay. that's okay. That's okay. okay. Our family, take, say thank you so much. Say thank you, Alizu. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for that word of encouragement. And it's so true, um, you know, the, the little things that we can do to impact people's lives and make a difference so that they're starting from a higher place than they would normally. And also thank you to Crispin and to Julie and for the family. And what a lovely, lovely birthday song for Albert this yeah. morning. So happy birthday, Albert. And I hope that you liked your very, very, very special happy birthday song. We're going to hand over to the children of MCF this morning who are going to tell our story. And it's Mount Sinai and a holy God. Some smoke, some thunder, an earthquake, and very loud trumpet. For two whole months, the Israelites had trudged through the desert. They had left Egypt and the Red Sea behind them and had walked for what seemed like ages. The Israelites had been travelling through the wilderness for some very long days and very long nights. Finally, the puffy white cloud that they were following stopped near a tall rocky mountain called the Mount Sinai. Everyone was happy to stop and rest and they set up camp. They had no idea what was going about to happen. Then Moses told them he was off up the mountain. Two hours later, he reached the top, and that was when God spoke to him. You have seen how I've rescued you from Egypt. Tell the people, if you obey me out of all the nations, I will make you my treasured people, even though the whole earth is mine. You will be my chosen special people. So Moses climbed back down the mountain to tell the leaders of people what God had promised together. They had replied, We will do everything the Lord has said. Then Moses went back up the mountain to tell God what the people had said when he reached the top. God told Moses, I am going to come to you in a thick cloud so the people will, will hear me speaking to you and will trust you. Moses told God uh, that, uh, that everyone said they were ready to do everything he commands. God told Moses, Tell the people to get cleaned up. Have them wash their clothes and be ready in three days because that's when I will come down. Put a boundary round the mountain. Anyone who touches the mountain will die. The people shouldn't go up the mountain or touch the mountain or touch any animal that has been on the mountain. Only when the ram's horn sounded a long blast can the people come near the mountain. So Moses went back down the mountain and gave everyone God's instructions. They washed their clothes and prepared to make themselves clean for God. They were, after all, probably very stinky after walking in the desert for so long. Three days later, just as God had said, the thunder roared and the lightning flashed and a thick cloud came down. Then there was a long blast of ram's horn the people out of their camp to the foot of the mountain. Smoke covered the mountain because God appeared on the mountain in, the, in fire. The smoke was rolling up the mountain like the smoke from a furnace. The mountain shook 
and the sound of the trumpets kept getting louder and louder. Moses called out to God to the Lord and God answered him. Everybody trembled. It was very, very scary. God invited Moses up to the top of the mountain and again warned him that the people should set themselves apart from God and should not approach the mountain. God then told Moses to go back down and this time to bring Aaron back with him. Moses did go back down the mountain and told everyone what God had said. So there was thunder, lightning, thick cloud, fire rolling down the mountain, smoke going up the mountain. The mountain is rumbling as it shakes and a trumpet is sounding, getting louder and louder and louder. Would you go up to the top of the mountain if you were invited? Fab, did you were great. Yes, you were. Well done. Well done. It's offering time, and yeah. this week it is our missions offering, our once a month missions offering, which we have said time and time again. Amazing. So overwhelmed us with the generosity of people uh, and the willingness amazing. to invest mm. in projects overseas. And this month our focus is the work of Roy and Jenny Ramble mm -hmm. in India, and they've sent us a video. Well, they sent us two, actually. Two videos. Yeah. So we're going to watch those two videos and then the details of how to give will be on the screen. Need I say more? No. So here we are with some of our princesses from the House of Glory. Yes! <laughs> we just want to give you a quick update about what's going on. The school hasn't begun as yet. And uh, the church, church is we've, going on. we've just finished a uh, Daniel fast, 21 days of Daniel fast. And I think the girls have really enjoyed it. Yes! yes. <laughs> Their skins are glowing. <laughs> <laughs> they're so healthy and they're ready for their exams. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are getting ready now for Lent. But in the school we still haven't reopened as yet the girls are still doing their online classes which i think they quite enjoy yes. Yes. and uh, they would rather not go to school and wear their uniforms and you know get ready in the morning and all that stuff but uh, maybe school is going to reopen very soon because the covid 19 cases have really come down in india and the buildings for the Boys' home in Shalom Raj Nivas. Well, that's uh, they, uh, they have started. Started the roof. Yes, we and started. Yes. 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 A big, big milestone because we said that we'll be starting in February, and on the first of February they started bringing in all the material. And we are so thankful to God for a gift that we received, and we can now finally seal the deal with the new land and yeah. the girls can eat even more chapatis and rice. Yes. 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 <laughs> and then we'll have to do another Daniel fast. Yes. So as you can see we're all well and uh, the mustard fields, the lentils in front of us and the straw that we're sitting on, it's uh, all so beautiful at this time of the year. But we love you all and thank you so much for praying for each one of us. Yes. We are so grateful to you all. We love you and we say bye bye. And bye, -bye.
beautiful. Oh, that's just... Oh. What a spirit of worship. Oh. Not just great to see. And that little one in that purple dress, just... <laughs> what an absolute cherub. Thank you, Jenny and Roy, for sending that to us. That's just... Made that's a day. Valentine present, isn't it? <laughs> that's Brilliant. a Valentine present. Oh, thank you so much. You know how you know how Graham's retired. Has he? Yeah, he doesn't. Oh, yes. He doesn't do the notices anymore. No. And we miss him for that, don't we? We miss him. Anyway, we've replaced him. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't miss him that much. <laughs> really quickly, with a young younger model. Oh, a younger model. We are delighted to hand over our time of notices to the one and only Jonathan Wilson, who will be giving us all the information that we need to have this week. Take it away, Jonathan. Hello, MCF, and welcome to this week's notices. So um, after church at around 11 o'clock, it has to be around 11 o'clock. So if you're watching this afterwards, it won't be after you finish. Um, you can join Zoom, which uh, seems to have um, random breakout rooms, which are always the same. So if you want to join that, um, you can send an email to office at mcschurch.co.uk. And tonight at 7.30, we have the WhatsApp prayer meeting. And that was Sunday night. And um, on Wednesday, we have at 7 till 8 p.m., we have um, the youth Skype, where we have lots of fun and games. And so uh, if, if any youth are out there, you can come and join the youth Skype. And also um, the clothes bank, uh, looking for donations of warm winter clothes, like coats and hats and hoodies, um, to arrange drop-off donations or to contact Ange Hollingham. Send an email to Andy, that's Andy Hollingham, at mcschurch.co.uk Bye Good morning We continue uh, the journey of Moses and the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt and on their way to the promised land We've seen God move in incredible ways and doing miraculous things. And equally, we've seen the people mumbling and grumbling and moaning and groaning. They don't like the bitter water or they don't like the lack of water or they get fed up with the manna. But in all of this, God is still at work leading them and directing them on their way. We get to Exodus chapter 19, and this is a pivotal point in the journey out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Verses 1 and 2 just sets the scene. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Raphidim, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. This will be an important time, an important place for Moses and the Israelites. The significant things would happen there. We're told that it was in the third month, on the very day, that they left Egypt, that they entered the desert of Sinai. We're told in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 11 that on the 20th day of the second month of the second year after they had left uh, Egypt the cloud lifted and the people set out from the desert of Sinai they were there for a period of 12 months or just short of 12 months and and in that time we have in the rest of the uh, the chapters of Exodus, we have uh, the account of what took place there. It also is recorded in the entire book of Leviticus and in the book of Numbers, chapters 1 to the beginning of chapter 10, covers this same period. Lots of things were happening. 
you know, I feel sorry for Moses. Moses is, uh, is obviously camped with the people in the desert in front of the mountain, Mount Sinai. But Moses is the mediator. He is the, the one who goes between uh, God and the people. He represents the people to God and he represents God to the people. And it seems to me that a lot of his time uh, throughout uh, Exodus, the rest of Exodus, he's going up and down the mountain several times. And I feel sorry for him. It reminds me of the nursery rhyme that um, the Grand Old Duke of York, and like the Grand Old Duke of York, uh, Moses uh, goes up, and when he's up, he's up the mountain top, and when he's down, He's down on the mountain. And when he's halfway up, he's neither up nor down. But actually, these are some very um, significant events that take place. And in this chapter, I just want to pick up on, on two. And that is, first of all, that God is a covenant-keeping God. God uh, tells Moses to speak to the people. And in verse 5, in verses 3, 3 to 6, it says this. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my com covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to Israel. The covenant between God and Israel at Mount Sinai is, in effect, an enlarging or an extension of God's covenant with Abraham, which took place about 600 years earlier. There, in Genesis 15, God's covenant with Abraham, a man with a barren wife and no, no son. God's promise is that in their old age, Abraham and Sarah would have a son. God says to Abraham, look up to the heavens and count the stars. So shall your offspring be. He also said, to your descendants, I will give the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. To a couple without hope, God gives hope and a future. Likewise to the people here at the foot of Mount Sinai, a people without a land to call their own, without hope and with no future. And God says to them, you will be my treasured possession. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's okay for them, but what about us now? Jesus came to bring us a new covenant. He did not abolish the law, the old covenant, but he came to fulfill it. The new covenant is an enlarging and an extension of the old covenant through Abraham and through what was given through Moses. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 we have these words. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not 
received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Through Jesus, we have access to this new covenant. It's not limited or restricted to a physical uh, nation, but it's expanded and enlarged uh, to all those who believe in Jesus and demonstrate God's love and mercy to a dying world, a world without hope and without a future. And that's the challenge we face in these days. Our faith in Jesus needs to be seen, needs to shine through, needs, needs to pierce the darkness with the light of Jesus. Let's seek God and the power of the Holy Spirit to be effective as the people of God. Not in our own strength, but in God's mighty power to impact on people's lives and to make changes, however small that, that they may be. We need to move forward little by little, taking ground. And we can all do this. The second point I want to talk about is God is a holy God. He is totally holy. And wants a holy people. A people set apart for himself. Moses speaks to the people and they respond together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to God. God is going to appear to Moses in a cloud so the people will hear God speaking to Moses and put their trust in Moses. But there were preparations. Moses was told to consecrate the people. They had to wash their clothes. They had to get ready. They had things to do before they came into the presence of a holy God. The external preparations for the people there is the same as the inward preparations we need to do. You know, we can become over familiar with God and we can become complacent. It doesn't really matter what I'm doing. It doesn't affect anyone else, but it does affect you. It affects your walk with God. It affects me. It affects my walk with God too. And it affects our impact, our witness uh, of Jesus to the world we're in and dealing with. The other preparations was that God insisted that there would be limitations put at the foot of the mountain. You know, God is a holy God, but he desperately wanted the people to make himself known to the people, for the people to uh, be aware of him and of his holiness. But to do that, they had to take some precautions if they strayed onto the mountain, God in his holiness would mean that they would be put to death. And it just struck me that there was a great reverence and fear um, about the holiness of God. We need to have that same reverence and fear of God in his holiness. We need to repent of sinful ways. Nothing is hidden from God. He knows our every thoughts. He knows all about us. But God, through the gift of Jesus, has made a way for us to be acceptable in his holy presence. God reveals, reveals himself to his people. If we read in uh, Exodus 19, uh, verses 16 to 19, it says this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. 
Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. It's a very graphical picture. Everyone in the camp trembled. They were very glad of the preparations they had made, the consecration, the washing of the clothes and the keeping of a safe distance at the foot of the mountain. Do we have that sense of trembling in the presence of a holy God? Yes, we can know that we are forgiven. We are accepted through the righteousness of Jesus. But are we still aware of God's holiness? There are times in my life when, like the writers uh, in the Psalms, I am undone, totally exposed and vulnerable before God. At these times, we can cast ourselves on God's mercy and forgiveness through Jesus. We can wear a robe of righteousness instead of a cloak of shame. Although God is holy, he still wants to reveal himself to his people, both then and now. There, God is so concerned that the people will rush up the mountain that he sends Moses down to warn the people to stay behind the markers, the limitations. God is totally holy. No darkness or sin can he tolerate. Through Jesus we have a way into the presence of a holy God, but we need to be serious about what we do, what we say and what we think. Nothing is a secret to God. That's the challenge we face. That's the challenge the people face then. It's the same challenge we face now. If we are to be effective for God, if we are to be effective witnesses of Jesus Christ, we need to be serious about who we are, about what we do. And, you know, we do have God's mercy, his grace and his forgiveness. But we need to be serious about what we're doing as well. And that's the challenge that I'm facing and that all of us are facing at this time. We want to be effective. We want to make change. We want to see changes happening in people's lives and in situations. God wants us to use us for that purpose as well. So let us draw near with confidence in the blood of Jesus to come into the presence of a holy God and for that to impact the way we live our lives, the decisions we make and the things we do. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Roland. You, Roland. Thank yeah, you. really good. Confident faith mm. in God that influences the way we relate mm. to him, the way we relate to each other, the way we relate to the world. Yes, that's yeah. true. Let's mm. be serious about, about our calling. Thank mm. you again for that encouragement. Mm. Now we have come to the end of another week. My goodness, don't they fly by? That'll be it. You'll miss us when we're gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna. The worship team is gonna lead us out, mm. uh, and we're just gonna pray uh, as uh, just before they do that. So let's pray together, shall mm. we? Father, we thank you for another time together. Yes. We thank mm. you that this is family, even mm. though we are physically separated. Mm. We are together in spirit. Mm. We're together on the screen. We're together in the common purpose mm. of, of all that you want to do and our hearts are reaching out to you because father we want to look ahead and we want to see what it is you have for us father god feed our faith feed our understanding renew us and restore us mm. in our relationship with you as Roland has spoken about and we just ask that you would 
fill each of us with your Holy Spirit mm. now as we come to the end of this service. This isn't the end of your dealings with us, but it is the beginning of a week. We're looking yes. forward to the mm. week ahead. And I pray with that confident faith that we will enter the week uh, knowing who we are in you mm. and what it is that you want from us. And so I pray for, for everyone watching this. Just pray your blessing upon every family mm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen and amen. And amen. Have a great week, folks. See you soon. Bye. Bye.